Hi everyone. Uh, are we good to go? Yeah. Cool. So my name is Yuan. Uh, this is my first Java forum. Super fun. Uh, I discovered Java forum through Code Snack this spring, actually. So I'm really happy to see such a big group of people actually doing software here in Gothenburg, meeting up regularly. That's good fun. Um, I'm going to talk about open source models, and it has nothing to do with modeling or databases or anything like that, but it, it's going to be purely about the whole concept of, of open source and, and open projects. Uh, first, quickly about me, uh, Johan Tallinn. Um, I work at a company called Kuro Studio, uh, which I co-founded this summer. Uh, so it's fairly early days still. I have a background in embedded systems and, and Linux and, and automotive. So it's, it's very far from enterprise Java systems. It's, uh, well, we have more memory now, but in the beginning, I think I have 32 Ks of RAM in my first system that I worked with at, uh, at Volvo back in 2003. Um, I write a bit. Some people recognize my name from Daughter Magazine. Uh, if you're into Qt, so C++, I guess it's the wrong conference for that, but still, uh, you might recognize my name from a couple of books around that. I also do uh, a meetup and a conference uh, that I help arrange here in the town. So, so FOSGBG is a monthly meetup around open source technology or processes or whatnot. Uh, and it's actually very fun to see that there are so many faces that I don't recognize in this meetup. Because if I go to, to other meetups, uh, it's the same people often. So, very welcome. Uh, and I actually asked Richard, and I was allowed to, to promote this. So, every April we, we do a conference called FOSS North. Um, we had a bit of a standoff between FOSS.com and FOSSGBG, who's going to bite the bullet and actually do a big conference, because it's a lot of work. And it ended up here, here in Gothenburg. So, so next year, basically April 7 through April 10, we will have a conference at, uh, at Chalmers uh, around open source in general. The call for paper will open in December, and I would love to see some enterprise Java contents, because I don't know those people. So <laughs> please, welcome, join us, have fun. So let's get to the point. <laughs> open source, I guess, are everyone familiar or experienced in open source? How, how many use open source software in their daily life, so to speak? And how many contribute? There's still quite a few hands. That's good. So, I mean, wh wh what is actually open source? Um, there, there is a def definition by, by the open source initiative. And, and free redistribution, you have access to the source code, you can derive work from it. It's, it's the things that, that we know as engineers. Th this is the practical part. But there, there's more to it. So you actually have the ability to protect the integrity of your source code. You can allow someone to only distribute patches with your source code to, to protect yourself. You're still open source. Uh, you cannot discriminate about anything. So even if you add a clause saying do no evil, that's not open source. It's a bit like democracy. You need to allow people to vote for something really, really bad, because as soon as you start narrowing the field down, you can sort of, you're on a slippery slope. So, so you have this. You, you cannot discriminate against anything. And then you have some, some aspects about the license itself. To, to be classified by the open source initiative as an open source license, the license itself needs to be sort of neutral. You, you can't have a license for a certain product or something like that. It has to be a generic license to, to be considered reusable from that perspective and, and be part of this standard. Did anyone see this? The, uh, the mail or all the news articles? I see one hand at least from, from Linus. I see more hands. Uh, this is kind of fun because it, it highlights wh what I'm here to say, that it's, it's more than just the open source model. And I, I took a couple of, of pictures in Borås just to try to illustrate what I'm saying. We're, we're trying to build a community. We, we don't want a piece of code, a dead penguin somewhere. We, we need to build something that lives and, and interacts, so to speak. So how do we do that? And, and I, I've been thinking about this, and I mean, you, I'm starting a new company, I'm considering how can you monetize, how, what do you have to think about for, for licenses and so on, and I've, I've sort of tried to create a scale from 
from what I call open core, so you're partly open source, all the way to what I call an open project. Um, and, and this is not science, and it's not sort of black and white. It, it's, a, it's a big gray zone. It's open for, for discussion and, and sort of different grades of, of how far you are into the different boxes. But I looked at a number of, of aspects. And I mean, the, the biggest one is the obvious one. It's the first three bullets. You share source code, and if you go towards open core, you share less source code. But you still have sort of an, a, a set of open source code. Um, but that's the de dead penguin, basically. So, so we need a bug tracker. That, that's always something nice. Uh, in my world, it's kind of interesting if you look at the Linux parts, because then you have a bug tracker for the distribution that captures some bugs, and then you have the upstream bug tracker and so on. So it's, it's, not, it, it's not easy to find the right bug tracker in some cases. But, but still, you need a bug tracker for a project to be able to share your current state and, and so on. And then you want to share your planning as well. So you actually need, I mean, these are all issues. I, if you're working with Jira, for instance, this would be in the same system. But looking at some projects, these are different. You might share your bugs, but you don't share your planning, and so on. So that's another aspect that I wanted to have a look at when exploring this. Then we have the whole open governance. Who, who actually makes the big decisions? That's, that's an interesting question. How, can, can you make this recursive? Is there a process to change the process, so to speak? I, is there a way to change who governs the project? Or, or do you pay your value there? Or do you have to fork to take control of a project? So it's, it's an interesting aspect. And then finally, I wanted to add one more aspect, and, that is and this is from your perspective as a contributor. Who keeps the copyright? Who owns the output of what you do? Do you get to keep it? Do you have to hand it over to someone? Are you recommended to hand it over to someone? What, what's sort of the, the policies around there? And then, again, starting a company, looking at opportunities and so on, it's, it's kind of fun to see where we see these models. Um, and I want to point out this. this. This is really important, that open source is itself not a business model. But by choosing a correct sort of open model, you, you can limit or restrict what you can do on the business model side. Um, so if, if you have an open core model, it doesn't mean that you make money from selling the expensive modules, because maybe nobody wants them still. Uh, but if you want to have that model, you, you need to adapt your licensing and your project and your, your governance to, to actually support that. So, so you, find, you find these models in different places. Uh, uh, open core, the, the rightmost box, uh, is like the Google Play services. You have an open source project, but you have the Play services that are proprietary. So then you have to pay license to actually carry them. Uh, dual licensing, if, if you give up copyright to someone, they can actually sell it under multiple licenses and, and monetize through that. Then you have the, the traditional open source model. You do services, you wrote the code, you, you can support it the best. Um, maybe you own the governance of the project, you can sort of control the direction. Uh, so that's, that's another sort of model around only the software part. And then you can sort of see the, the other halves that are coming more and more. Uh, software as a service <coughs> is a big topic. Who has heard about the Commons clause, for instance? Uh, I see a couple of ads. So, so basically, it's a bit controversial. Uh, Redis are trying to prevent companies like AWS from making money on their software. And then they discriminate, so it's no longer open source. But they do it by adding something to the open source license instead of removing the open source license and saying that this is closed. Um, and you can al always sell physical products. I mean, sell a handset, sell a car, sell something with software in it, and, and then you make money from something I indirect. And then I decided to have some fun around this and, and, and look at a couple of projects to sort of demonstrate the scale. Um, and, and this is sort of where this tiered model breaks to, to some extent, because you can turn these on and off independently. You become more open the more you have, but it doesn't mean, well, if you have the bug tracker, you don't have to share the source code, so to speak. They, they don't always add on each other. And during a, a FOSTUBG meetup, I asked about really bad projects 
from from an openness perspective that are, that are still open source and that are that are good projects and it, it's kind of fun because we found the X screen saver that have sort of managed to get itself semi forked even as one. This is a really fun project because you can download a tar tar tarball. There is no Git. There is no CVS. There is nothing where where you can get the the history of the code. Uh, it's a mix of licenses, but it, it's open source from, from a code perspective. Um, there is a page on how you write a bug report and mail it to the maintainer's private mailing address. <laughs> there is no public bug tracker. So it's, it's a single guy enjoying coding, but it's not an open project. Um, then it's a good product, so he still has adoption. But still, th this is the simplest of the simplest project. It's only a code project. Um, looking at Android, which is kind of fun, they, they have this Android open source project. And this, to, to me, Android is an open core project because as soon as you try to do something, as soon as you try to build a device with Android, you need to have the Play services to get access to the Play Store or, or you have to talk to, uh, to Amazon to get their store or Yandex is big in Russia, for instance, and so on. There are a number of Play Stores, but there are services that you need in addition to the Android open source project, and you need to fulfill compliances to be able to ship that, and so on. And it, then it starts costing money. So it's, it's an open course project. Uh, the source code is available to the core, which is multiple components, but the core of the project. Um, it's a mix of licenses, of course. It, it contains the, a fork of the Linux kernel, or a, a line of the Linux kernel, I should say. Um, they have a public issue tracker. Um, they accept external contributions. I mean, the kernel definitely does, so, so parts of it are easier to maintain, to affect than others. But at the same time, the, the planning and governance, that, that's Google. Uh, that's, from, from my perspective, as a, from, from automotive, when you, when the early adopters of putting Android in a car took that risk, they actually had the risk that Google would do what they do now with Android Auto, because as soon as Google says that this is the API to, to access vehicle speed or controlling the tuner or something, then you're run over because you have no control. You can't contribute such a central thing. They plan and they run the project as they like. GCC was actually also something that was pointed out during this, this uh, FOSS GBG meeting. And, and it's kind of interesting because this is an, uh, a GNU project, uh, the GNU compiler collection. Uh, all the source code is available, it's GPL, so they sort of fulfill those requirements again, otherwise they wouldn't be on the list. They have a public issue tracker, they, they share planning, you, you can do contributions. But they also have a steering committee for major decisions that I can't really see how you get onto. Uh, so the governance, I would say, is at least not fully open. And, and the steering committee is supposed to represent the needs of the industry. Uh, so there are representatives from various big vendors using, well, producing silicon, for instance, that needs a compiler and so on. Uh, they also recommend that you sign over your copyright to the Free Software Foundation. They don't require it, but they recommend it, hence the the diagonal box over here. <laughs> so they could, I mean, if they requested it, they could have resold it using different licenses, but they only recommend it. So, and they're not a commercial entity from that perspective. So, so it's not a part of what they do. These guys, on the other hand, Qt. Uh, I use the Qt framework a lot. Uh, so, so this is something that I've been working with for for years and years. Uh, They've actually made a journey from being like open core over here to, to moving in the direction of an open project. And, and it's very interesting to see that from a commercial perspective because they've done it to, to gain momentum, basically. It, it started with a strange license, the QPL, which wasn't even open source, but they start it had the effect that you could share the source, you can build it for a different platform, and then they went GPL with their Unix platform. OS X came, so you had an X11 server on OS X, so they opened up the OS X support, and then they opened up Win32. Uh, and these days, they actually leverage GPL v3 to get license money back from people putting it into devices. 
because GPL v3 has uh, a TBOization clause, as it's called. The, there's an American company called TBO that makes set-top boxes, uh, and they fulfilled all the all the requirements of GPL, but the bootloader wouldn't boot anything that wasn't signed by them. So GPL v3 remedies that. That's the TBOization core. You need to share the secret key so you can actually install the things as well. It's not only about building it. Uh, but they fulfill all this. They, they have an issue tracker. They have a governance model. There's a, a the Qt project. It is sort of a foundation built around this. There's a process for assigning maintainers for different modules. You, you sort of, you can make a career within the project and there's a clearly defined stage how to do it. There's a company called the Qt Company sort of owning the copyright for everything, reselling it, being the biggest contributor. And of course, they have the most maintainer roles. But they're not the only maintainers. They, there are other people with other affiliations that can actually make big decisions in the framework. So it's it's very interesting to see that they actually made a progress to uh, to the left side here without going bankrupt. And then we have the the most open project of them all, so to speak, in in this scale. The, there are others, but you have the, the Linux kernel. I mean. I say there's an open governance because basically there is a very uncontrolled governance, but nobody will ever stop anyone from making a proposal or making a fork or sort of maintain something. Uh, so it's very open from that perspective and nothing happens between closed doors. Of course, there are discussions and, 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 and big stakeholders, but the project itself does not have like an inner steering circle and an outer public facing factor. Uh, I call this herding cats as well. It's a common term for, but this is the perfect example. I mean, it's it's basically uncoordinated, but it moves in a in a single direction. So it's it's fun to see that work on this scale. I mean, it's growing so quickly, and it, it's such a big project, and it still is able to maintain direction, which is really cool. So these are just some examples of, of that you can have different levels of openness. And I mean, from my perspective, from, from an open source perspective, it's uh, this is a nicer model, definitely, from, from a contributor's perspective and also from a user's perspective. This gives me the most influence and the most control of what I do. And then, for instance, the Qt company do, uses dual licensing, so they need a CLA, you need to sign over the copyright to them. But that's how they fund the development, so, and so on. Different projects have different needs and... and well, different scales, basically. Uh, but then there's the licenses. Let, let's have a look at those first. Uh, <laughs> so do, do you know the difference between strong copyleft and permissive licenses and, and sort of this field? So, so how many here are, are familiar with the GPL set of licenses? I mean, the, the FSFE ones. So they are traditionally strong copyleft, that what Microsoft called viral licenses. They they sort of spread and they you need if you if you build on that you you also need to redistribute under that license so to speak so it, it's it's viral from that perspective and if you if you link to something you have to fulfill the requirements yourself and then there's a lesser GPL the LGPL or the library GPL which means that you can dynamically link to it and keep your stuff secret but any changes you make to the library you rely, rely on still has to, to sort of go upstream, so it, it keeps the license in there. <laughs> then you have the, the weaker cover left, or the, the permissive licenses. Uh, and now, now we kind of come to, to history. So you, you have BSD, the, the Berkeley Standard Distribution, MIT, another university. And, and I mean, the GNU project was a reaction out of when Unix became commercialized or sort of closed down. Uh, these, comp these licenses are, are sort of earlier. So, so they allow you to take the source and, and redistribute it as long as you keep a copyright claim and you don't blame the author for anything that goes wrong and things like that. But you can close down your modifications on them. That's why they're called permissive or, or slightly weaker. And then you have this from the, the good old Amiga days and so on, public domain. Nobody claims it, so use it for whatever you like. Uh, and since it's software, you can copy it and then it really becomes public domain because you can duplicate it. Uh, and, and from a licensing perspective, this, this is kind of interesting because you can always depend. Strong copyleft can depend on weaker copyleft, of course. 
because, well, you can change the uh, the licensing of the outcome of this, so to speak, when you change it. So that direction is allowed. And, and of course, it, it also holds that non-copyleft is actually weaker than copyleft. Then these licenses themselves, I mean, all the examples here have individual dependencies as well, but then, then you want to talk to a lawyer. Uh, but the interesting part is that the arrows do not go backwards. So th there are companies making fortunes on, on just ensuring that you don't screw up when you do these things, that you actually link in the right order. And, and sort of have the dependencies in the correct directions because you can shoot yourself in the foot otherwise quite severely. Um, so that's an in interesting factor to, to keep in mind as well when you choose your licenses and around your business model and so on. If you're here, you can allow someone to actually sort of embrace and extend and change the licensing. If you're up here, nobody can do that. But then if you want to be able to resell it under a different license, you need to own the copyright, so to speak. Uh, so, I mean, a again, this, this is not a big business model, but it's a restricting factor when creating a business model, definitely. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I just saw one liking this <laughs> domain. This is my absolute favorite. I should have grabbed a screenshot. So you can look up any license there, and it basically has three columns. You have to do this, you can do this, and you cannot do this. And it's super simple, so you don't have to read through pages and pages of legalese. And then they always say, ask a lawyer. I mean, this is just a summary. It gives you an indication of where we are. So you need to read the license to actually understand it. Uh, you also have opensource.org, uh, which is kind of interesting because they, they carry the definition that I showed first. But they also carry a list of all the approved licenses. So I mean, if you're unsure about the license, if you see something that looks strange, you can always look it up there and sort of ensure that this is, OK, it's strong couple left, it's weak couple left. It has been approved, it's not approved, so to speak. So, so these are good resources. And, and now I've talked a lot about the, the, the openness, and I wanted to do a, a funny handover, like the penguins, and I realized there is none. But the cheesy handovers always come from, from the weather people, so some dark clouds. Because you, you have things that restrict you in the other direction and that I feel are necessary. So I mean, e even, I mean, I'm a strong pro proponent of open source, but there, there are still places where, where you need to restrict openness, and, and there's actually a value to that. Uh, so you have the, the contributors license agreement. Um, for instance, I'm, I linked to, or I talked about this QML book, or at least the title was on one of the slides. So, so you can find it on GitHub, you can read it online, but me and my co-author want to be able to print it one day. That means that everyone that does a typo fix or something for us needs to sign an agreement that we actually have access to the copyright so that we can in turn sell it to a publisher that day that we turn it into physical goods. The cute company does this as well. But it's, it's generally a short contract that you have to, to sign before you can actually contribute to it. Uh, the most basic ones is an assignment of copyright, but usually you have all of these follow-ups that I'm not infringing any patents, the code is actually mine, I'm allowed to give it away, all these things. So it, it sort of formalizes the relationship between the project and the contributor. And it's, it's quite common, I would say. Um, this is fun. <laughs> Responsible disclosure. Uh, it's completely contradictory to, to everything about project openness, I would say, because you, you restrict access to information and you even restrict access to, to patches. Um, I had a quick chat to, to Daniel Steinberg, uh, the Mr. Carl Badger, uh, about this, and he, he sort of pointed to, to their process. You have a link down here. I'll share the slides afterwards if you can't see the lower right corner. Uh, but basically what they do is that if they get a security report, some, something's broken and something can be used to hack. I mean, they have a, probably a billion deployments, so there is a buffer overflow there, so you can take over every Android phone in the world or something similar. They have a list, limited trusted set of people on a mailing list. Those get the bug report, so it's not in the open tracker. Uh, they plan and uh, agree on how to fix it, and also how the researcher or the person who found it can disclose it. 
So I mean, usually you have a time window. I found the bug, I reported it, and now I waited for three months, and now it's fair that I can actually publish my paper as well. Uh, and then they are part of a system called distros at OpenWall that allows distributions to, to get this information as well. So it's, it's another step basically saying that we have a problem with this version and there will be a patch so that they can synchronize so that everyone can push it at once so that nobody's left standing with the older version and everyone sees the patch so it's fairly obvious to see what the problem is. They themselves have eight week release cycles. So I mean they close it within two months. If it's urgent, they can do it earlier. And, and this, for instance, this is completely contradictory to, to all that open source stands for, but ev I think everyone agrees that it's necessary because we can't just tell everyone that this is how you break the system and then give people a week to hack everything while we try to close the bug and distribute it. This allows everyone, all the users, to synchronize around this. Another interesting aspect that is actually quite common in the really big open source program, big organizations, is the use of trademarks. So, so they, product, they, they protect their brand. So Arduino, Mozilla, Firefox, the, there are more examples that do this. So, so you can sort of create an official build. Everyone can take Firefox and rebuild it. I mean, you have Ice Weasel for, for Debian because they don't want the trademark in there. So that they can rename it and build the same code and just change the logo and the name of it. And then they're done. There's no trademark anymore. And, and when researching this, I actually found this. You can buy something called LibreOffice for $3 in, in the Windows App Store. Uh, this could be stopped because LibreOffice and that logo is trademarked. But if that would not have been the case, you cannot really stop this kind of sort of abuse of the trademark and or of the value of the project. So it's, it's actually quite important uh, when you start interacting with end consumers. Uh, the problem here is that it actually somebody needs to register this one. For, for smaller projects, of course, like the founder or the core maintainer can take it on themselves to do so, but, but as soon as you have a big project, you need a legal entity around it, a foundation or even a company. And also, it, it costs money to register these things, not that much, but if you're going to sh challenge something like this, then you're going to court and you're suing someone, so you need to pay your lawyers. If you win, you get your money back, but it's always a gamble going in there. So it's, it's for the big ones, I would say, but it's, it's something that you see and something that doesn't affect the openness of the project or the source. Then we have something that I don't know much about, export restrictions. Um, it used to be a big topic. You could buy t-shirts with this uh, DCSS algorithm printed on them because it was illegal to export it from the US in sort of digital form or a source code, but you can print it in a book or something. So it's just silly rules around that software is Dangerous, but other types of goods is not. So, so information and information was treated differently. Uh, just reading up on it a bit, the restrictions have definitely been eased uh, since the 90s, so the past 30 years, but they're not completely gone. Th there is a list in the US of uh, rogue states like Sudan and some, some other places that you're not allowed to export cryptography to, or strong cryptography to. And, and I mean, this is completely, you cannot do that with open source, since that's a discrimination. You, you cannot do that restriction. And, and that's actually not so much a problem to open source, because the, the projects themselves don't really care, and anyone can download it as soon as you're in the internet, so to speak. But it's a problem for the individuals contributing to open source, because you contributed an implementation of an encryption algorithm, and it ends up in one of these states, and then you could be liable for it, so to speak. Uh, so it's kind of complicated life. I don't know of any court cases of anyone actually getting in trouble for this. Uh, and it was a bigger thing 10, 15 years ago. But it's not completely gone. And then you have one of the, the really big ones, patents. Uh, are, are you aware of software patents? I see a few hands. It, it's kind of scary because you can't see them by looking at the code. You, you need to look at the, uh, the patent registrations in, in the databases. And I mean, it's not obvious. Uh, it, it could be Google describing some algorithms in English, and you need to sort of map it that, oh, this is this algorithm implemented. 
Uh, so, so they can sort of be found in your code. And if you go open, of course, it's easier because then you can see the code. So you sort of expose yourself from that perspective. Um, and then they can be enforced retroactively. So you used our patents for the last 10 years, and we want our license money. <laughs> um, so, so you can sort of get into a difficult situation from that perspective, especially if you sort of commercialize around this. So they want to cut off your sales for the past years, but you use that to pay salaries or whatnot. Uh, and also, this is something that you get sued over. So, so you need to defend yourself in court, uh, which doesn't come for free. I mean, you need to pay your lawyers until you know that you won your case. Or if you lose it, you have to pay the other guy's lawyers as well. So, I mean, there are patent trolls that simply force people to settle for three, five, ten thousand dollars and And that's actually an industry because it's cheaper to pay them off than to go to court, to, even though the patents they bring is stupid. Um, it's still a discussion if you can, if you can copy or if you can patent a, a pure software algorithm, um, and it depends on where you are geographically uh, in the world, so to speak. And and I mean the the challenge again then from an open source perspective is that you might sit in Sweden and do this, but if you put it on GitHub, the server is in the US and your user might be in Canada or wherever, so to speak. So, so you're sort of out of control where your stuff ends up and you might find your stuff in a legal space where what you did was illegal and, and get yourself in trouble. So this is actually scary. Um, there's something called the Open Invention Network, which is free to join. So, so anyone having a company, I would recommend joining there. It's a patent pool. So, I mean, you have the big ones, you have IBM, you have Google, you have Microsoft even joining in there. And the, the idea is to defend Linux. So, so you, if you use Linux and you get sued, you're a part of a patent pool and then can sort of haggle over the patents. So, so usually when, when a big company gets sued over a patent intrusion, they have so many patents that they can find an intrusion on the other side and then they settle and sort of calms down. The problem is when someone with a patent hunts someone without a patent, so to speak, or a big one hunts a small one. And, and here, lots and lots of small ones, well, Google and Microsoft and so on, lots and lots of companies have, have joined into a single pool for a purpose, to, to make it risk-free to use Linux in general. Uh, so, I mean, join it. It's free, definitely. Uh, there's also something called uh, defensive publications. So, so when you register a patent, you public, publicly describe what you register. Uh, and then you say when you did it. So, so when you do something that's innovative, you can also describe it. But the important thing is you describe it with a date. Because if someone who tries to register the same idea afterwards, you can nullify the patent quite easily. But if you don't have that documentation, you need to find a paper trail over it that holds up in court. But then I've, I've, I've complicated everything throughout this talk. I mean, we, we start with X Screensaver, we make fun of X Screensaver. It's a guy distributing a tarball. You can mail him reports. And, and you need all of this. You need, well, a uh, code of conduct, like for Linux. You, you need a public issue tracker. You, you need a governance structure. You need processes. You're turning into a big company. You have all these risks. But again, I, I would say that nothing works without code. That's why it's open source. So, so the takeaway is, Yes, there's all of this. There's all of this for the big project. But if you want to start something, code first. The, the, the tarball is actually the easiest way to get started. And that's how you start these things. Don't, don't add all the infrastructure before you need it. And that's the end of, of what I had to say. Any questions? <laughs>